Scientists like to group things, such as elements, minerals, and even planets, into groups. The same is true of biologists, who are faced with studying literally millions of different types of organisms, and they're just the ones alive on this planet today. Hello, my name is Elizabeth, and I am an A-level biology student and the co-founder of Science Rocks. And today I'm going to tell you how and why biologists use the concept of classification, or taxonomy, to study all living organisms and the extinct ones. But first, a story. Paul Linnaeus was the eldest of five children and the son of a minister, and was born in Sweden in 1707. His father was a keen gardener, and by the age of five, Carl had his own small garden and was very eager to learn everything he could about the plants and how they work. At the time, all plants had Latin names, as they do now, but back in the 1700s, the names were a lot longer and tended to be descriptive. Carl set about learning their names and everything he could, to the extent that he eventually ended up studying medicine at university. You have to remember that at this time, medicine was mostly based on plants, and so it was quite common for a keen botanist to go on and study medicine. Carl changed universities in search of a better education, and by chance he happened to be in the botanical garden of Uppsala University when a Professor Olaf Celsius, uncle of Anders Celsius who invented the Celsius thermometer, met him and was amazed that Carl knew all the Latin names of all the plants in the garden. In fact, he was so amazed that he offered Carl financial assistance and even let him use his own private library. And it was at this time that Carl wrote his paper on the classification of plants based on their sexual organs. Although he may not have realised it at the time, this was a massive scientific breakthrough and led to the development of taxonomy, classifying organisms based on their shared characteristics and features. And this led to Carl Linnaeus being invited to lecture in botany. From 1732, Carl spent three years travelling and recording information on Sweden's natural resources. He used his newly developed binomial system to classify and name all of the plants and animals he found, and he encouraged his students to use the same system. In 1735 he arrived in Holland, and quickly finished his medical degree and eventually became the supervisor of a private zoo. It was during this time that Carl wrote and published many scientific papers and books on taxonomy. But that was not the only impact on science. His influence led to a great period of exploration, where naval vessels were encouraged to carry scientists as part of the exploration team. One such vessel was the Beagle, and yes, Charles Darwin was on that ship, observing new species and formulating his ideas on evolution. In 1747, Carl Linnaeus was appointed Royal Physician in Sweden, and he was knighted as a reward for his scientific research. After an incredible career and a short retirement, he died in 1778. But here we are now, nearly 250 years later, still using the binomial system that he developed as a young student. There is one last part of the story. If you thought Linnaeus didn't sound particularly Swedish and sounded a bit Roman, you would be right. Carl was born Carl Linnaeus, but believed in his work so much that he used his binomial system to create the name Carolus Linnaeus. And Carl Linnaeus is how he will always be remembered. As the father of modern taxonomy, the science of sorting living organisms into groups to aid scientific research. Oh yes, and along the way he developed the science of ecology. So here we are. 250 years after the death of Linnaeus. I'm in Forest Hill, a suburb in South London. It's a normal suburb where people live and work, home to the Horn of a Museum, an excellent place to be for our documentary on taxonomy. Today we will be meeting with Dr Emma Louise Nichols. I am now inside the Horniman Museum, surrounded by a fantastic array of organisms that have been mounted in order to show how they are related. Each one of them is labelled using the binomial system devised by Carl Linnaeus. I apologise now, there's going to be a bit of Latin. Some of the words are ancient Latin words from the Roman world. Some are derived from Latin roots, and you may spot a few that are 
well, they're made up and lacking in imagination. But the important thing is that the naming system is a great help to biologists and it also acts as a truly international language that helps scientists around the world communicate. When we talk about any organism, we are talking about species, and in order to identify the species, we have a Latin name made up of two parts. The first part is the genus, and the second part is the actual species. A lion is genus Panthera and species Leo, so a lion is Panthera Leo. A tiger is genus Panthera, but its species name is Tigris. We can tell they are related through a shared genus, so we expect them to have a lot in common but they are also two separate species, which at its most basic level means we can tell them apart. By definition, a species is a group of organisms which can interbreed to create viable offspring capable of further reproduction. In other words, lions and tigers do not successfully mate. But back to the bigger picture, because there's a lot more to it than just genus and species. Here is a chart. You can see that I've hidden something at the top. I'll come back to that in a moment. There are five kingdoms. These are prokaryote, protoctist, fungi, plants and animals. Below kingdoms we have phylum, then class, order, family and then genus and species. If we use tiger as an example, we all know that a tiger is an animal, so the kingdom is animalia. Animals are divided into those with backbones and those without. Tigers definitely have a backbone. They belong to the phylum Chordata. They belong to the class Mammalia. They give life birth. And beyond that, they belong to the order Carnivora. They are, after all, meat eaters, and they are members of the cat family. But in Latin, we refer to that as Felidae. And lastly, genus Panthera and species Tigris. A moment ago I mentioned that I had hidden something at the top and now it's time for the big reveal. Sitting above the five kingdoms is the taxon of domain. The domain of eukaryota contains four of the kingdoms, protoctist, fungi, plants and animals and the last domain, eubacteria, contains the single kingdom of bacteria. The distinction between these two domains is quite simple, but also subcellular, something that Carl Linnaeus would never have known. There are no big cats up here. We are surrounded by a fantastic collection of much smaller animals, and they are amazing to study, as you can see how they are related and how they each adapt to their own environment and ecosystem. Any one of these panels is a fantastic representation of taxonomy in action. But before we go any further, it's time to introduce Dr. Emma Louise Nichols, Deputy Curator of Natural History at the Horniman Museum. Hello, Emma. Thank you for joining us this morning. The museum has a varied range of exhibits built up over the last century, but the most fascinating section is the natural history exhibit. Can you tell us a bit about the collection and its relevance to studying taxonomy at GCSE and A level? Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for letting me be part of your video. Um, so Horniman uh, is a, was a Victorian collector, philanthropist, and very famous for the tea trade, of course. Um, and he collected, uh, as you mentioned, a number of different uh, things, musical instruments, anthropological objects, but most importantly, natural history specimens. And in uh, 1898, he'd collected such a huge amount that he opened a museum. He opened his house, his own house, as a museum, uh, much to the chagrin of his wife, I think. Uh, that was in 1898. It's called Surrey House Museum. Um, in the first year, it got 42,500 visitors. Which wow. is very impressive, um, but it outgrew uh, the house because he carried on collecting, uh, and so he then uh, demolished it and built this museum, which opened in 1901, just five years before he passed away. Um, so the uh, Natural History Gallery, uh, you asked me about the taxonomy, the uh, gallery upstairs, the balcony, is actually arranged taxonomically. So if you're studying taxonomy and systematics, rather than go to the library and 
use books or look on the internet, as you probably do these days rather, um, you can actually come to this museum and you can see the taxonomy laid out in front of you. Uh, over to the left behind us, we've got the invertebrates. And over to the right behind me, we've got the vertebrates. And they're laid out in order, starting with kingdom, going down through phylum, family, down to species, uh, so that you can see, and with actual specimens to show you um, what a number of examples would look like. So it's thanks to Frederick Horneman and his desire to collect curiosities and artefacts to bring the world to Forest Hill to educate local people. I'm going to take you back in time. We are now on the ground floor of the Natural History Exhibition and we have moved away from the smaller animals we saw in the upper gallery. This lower gallery houses a vast array of exhibits, many of which date back to Victorian times. In fact, there's an interesting feel to this exhibit. This really is a place where we can learn about the advances in classification, taxonomy and ecology whilst walking through a time capsule that stands monument to the Victorian and Edwardian desire to collect and learn. In fact, I'm now standing in front of one of Forest Hill's oldest and best loved residents. Taxonomists and members of the Linnaean Society may know this chap as Odobinus Rosmasus. Let's just take a quick look at the taxonomy. Kingdom, Animalia, obviously. Phylum, Chordata. He has a backbone. Class, Mammal. This, is, give, this animal gives birth to live young. It definitely doesn't lay eggs. Order, Carnivore. But the teeth are not necessarily a clue to being carnivorous. These teeth look like they are designed for display and defending territories and mates. Family, Odobinidae. This family includes seals, genus Odobinus, and species Rosmasus. And of course, to bring us completely up to date, this amazing beast belongs to the domain Eukaryota, containing cells that have subcellular membranes. But the story doesn't end there. There are two subspecies, Odobinus Rosmasus Rosmasus, the Atlantic walrus first recognized by Linnaeus in 1758, and Odobinus rosmasus divergens, the Pacific walrus first recorded by Illiger in 1815. <laughs> Taxonomy doesn't just link species that share the same space on the timeline. Relationships can cross hundreds of thousands of years, even millions of years. Just take a look at this exhibit. We can quite clearly see that the skeletons share a number of characteristics. They all have five digits on their feet and hands, and they all have a pelvis that facilitates varying levels of upright walking. But there are also some differences. Take a look at the proportions in the arms, legs, and body length. We could also see similarities, but also subtle differences in skull shape, finger length, and the way the ankle bones and toe joints are configured. To tell us more about this exhibit, I would like to introduce Emma. Uh, so in the exhibit behind me, we've got a number of uh, great apes. Uh, we've got orangutans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. And a lot of people use the phrase, humans evolved from monkeys. And that came, of course, from uh, Darwinism. Whilst it's um, not entirely inaccurate, it's not the best way of explaining it. Essentially, what this exhibit is showing, the similarities between them, it's not saying that they're the same things. We are not a type of orangutan, say. Um, the way that primate and human evolution has worked is, if you imagine it like a ladder, you can either go up the side, up the long side, or you can get off and sit on a run. So if you imagine an animal, a hominid, uh, that's something that looks like these. Um, so before the monkeys, before the prosimians, which is the lemurs, and of course before great apes, which includes us, um, it would have um, changed and adapted into an animal that came off onto one of those rungs on the ladders and stayed there, so the lemurs. The common ancestor, as we call it, would have carried on up the side, <laughs> um, and it would have evolved into, say, the monkeys, so they would have come off. 
So monkeys are not on the side, they've come off and evolved into monkeys. If you then continue up, you get the great apes, and if you continue up to the top, then you get humans. So we haven't come from monkeys, we've, humans and monkeys have come from a common ancestor. Thank you. Emma, you've studied paleontology and geology, so you will have been used to looking at the fossil record to identify different species. Could you tell us about the specimens in, di in this display and how you have used taxonomy to relate them? Um, yes, yeah, sure. So my PhD was on fossil and modern sharks, so that's my area of specialism. And the display behind us, as you can see, has got uh, both modern and fossil shark material in it. Um, the, working out taxonomic classifications of prehistoric groups is phenomenally difficult, uh, primarily because you don't get every single feature that you would want to use to classify something uh, preserved in every specimen that you find. Um, sharks and rays are a perfect example of why that's so difficult, because um, the whole skeleton in a shark and a ray is made of cartilage, like in your ear. Uh, which doesn't fossilise well. Uh, so the only things that you get in the fossil record, normally there are exceptional situations, uh, normally are the teeth. Um, and so you can only, in a lot of cases, you can only use the teeth to work out what species they're from, what family they belong to. Um, with something um, like, for example, Carcharodon megalodon, that particular species is very well known. Everyone's heard of megalodon. But actually, there's still a lot of debate about which family it belongs in, the lamelliforms or the carcariniforms, because the uh, teeth are the only things that we've got. And because they eat the same things, those two groups of animals, the teeth end up looking the same. Taxonomy can be used to group organisms both alive and dead, no matter how many millions of years they may have lived. Thank you. Now one last question. The Horniman Museum houses some fantastic collections, and one of them in particular is of interest to you as a geologist. Can you tell us about your work on recataloguing the Horniman Bennett Fossil Collection, which has over 170,000 individual items? Where did you start? Well, that is a very good question. Where did I start? Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge collection, and it's all down uh, at the off-site stores in a, in a room that is full of cabinets. There are 57 huge uh, wooden cabinets, which is Bennett's original uh, housing for the collection. And where I started was um, looking at uh, a series of um, database records that had been done in the 90s that for some reason, some quirk of history, um, had been disassociated with the specimens. Uh, so what I mean by that is the uh, 4,000 uh, records on our database could not be correlated with the 4,000 specimens that were interspersed in the 170,000 within these cabinets. Uh, so it took a lot of patience, a lot of skills and experience as a paleontologist to be able to work out using taxonomy, primarily actually as a tool. Um, I have now done about 90% of those 4,000 have been reunited. Um, that's about eight months, almost solid work. <laughs> uh, so the, the next thing to do, um, once those have been sorted out, is to accession the rest of the specimens uh, which, as you can imagine, is no small feat. Um, once that's been done, once they've been identified and accessioned, I can then facilitate use of the collection to external researchers, and that, as a museum, is why we keep specimens. So that's the end game. Thank you, Emma. It has been absolutely amazing to hear about your work at the museum and your project reclassifying the Horniman Bennett Fossil Collection. Thank you for taking part in our documentary. Thank you for letting me. <laughs> We all know that museums can be stuffy places. In fact, when I first visited the Science Museum in London when I was four years old, my only memory was of seeing dead things in jars. So far, we have seen dead exhibits, some of them millions of years old. But if we stopped here, we would be missing out on a large and exciting part of the collection in this amazing museum.
I mentioned earlier that Linnaeus didn't just invent the science of taxonomy, but by linking features and adaptations to the environment, he gave rise to the study of ecology. We are now in the aquarium exhibition at the Horniman Museum. There are a number of different environments, ranging from British coastal to tropical coral reefs. There is even a miniature mangrove swamp. Here, for students of all ages, is a brilliant exhibition linking taxonomy and ecology using living exhibits. You can see firsthand how these fish and other marine organisms have adapted to their environments to live and thrive. They have developed camouflage and their own methods of hunting. They have developed different solutions to the problem of laying eggs and here in this tank we can see an excellent example of jellyfish. At first glance they appear to be so simple and you would think that they have no control over their environment and yet jellyfish have evolved over millions of years to adapt to a wide variety of different marine habitats. I just want to talk about biochemical and molecular evidence and how it is now used in taxonomy, but first an explanation of genotype and phenotype. A genotype is the complete set of genetic instructions which makes each and every one of us unique. Phenotype is the outward physical expression of those instructions and is what happens when external factors interact with your genetic code. Here is a simple example. A young human baby might have the genetic potential to be big and strong, but if insufficient nutrition is available, and if there is no opportunity or desire to exercise, the individual may not reach their full potential. As humans, we can affect our environments. We can take advantage of what is on offer, and we can choose to make changes, or be forced, through circumstances, to adapt but our genetic information remains intact and is something that will be passed on to the next generation. So how does this relate to the science of taxonomy? Through Darwin's research we have seen how environments can have an effect on change. Organisms adapt and as we have seen in his work with finches, different environments can result in the development of new species and subspecies. In other words, the combination of environments and genotype can lead to a different phenotype. So it can be misleading if we just focus on external characteristics. We can now use DNA sequences or the genome to more accurately classify organisms based on their genetic information rather than their outward characteristics. This is a more accurate method of classification. So, as the use of DNA sequencing becomes more prevalent, it is possible that we might find some changes to our current knowledge about classification. We have looked at the life of Linnaeus and the creation of taxonomy as a biological science used to group species together so that we can learn more about them. We have seen how various taxons help to relate all of the species and how the science has evolved over the years. But this is not a story with a beginning, middle and an end. Taxonomy itself continues to evolve. New species are still being discovered and there are places in the world, on land and in the oceans, that have yet to be fully explored. We are now using DNA sequencing to identify new species and we are going over old ground to make sure our current relationships between species are still correct. And as we have heard, Emma continues her research on the Horniman Bennett fossil collection so that one day it will be a useful resource for other students and scientists. I have learnt a lot making this film, so much more than I would have done from reading a book or looking on the internet. The Horniman Museum is an amazing place, with an ornamental garden, live alpaca and sheep, an excellent music exhibition and a big anthropology hall. I would finally like to thank the Horniman Museum for letting me come and make my documentary and Dr Emma Louise Nichols for telling us about her work at the museum. Now I'm off for a cup of tea with Dr Emma Louise Nichols because I've heard in her spare time she's a fan of sci-fi and sharks and so am I. <laughs>